Welcome to this week's Wall Camp Chapel. My name is Mufasa. If you haven't joined us before, we typically sing a couple songs. We have a brief meditation and a prayer followed by a couple more songs. Today's meditation comes from Psalm 119, verse 105. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light unto my path.
taking a break from our chapel series this week to focus on Advent. The Advent is a season of expectation, a season of preparing uh, for Christmas, for Jesus Christ to be born and to come to earth, for God to come and dwell with us. And one thing that some families do is they light a candle each week to symbolize where they are on this journey as they're preparing for Christ and for his coming. So today we light the first candle, which sometimes is called the prophet's candle. Now a prophet is someone who God comes and talks to and says, I have a message to give to my people, go and give this message. So these are men and women who throughout the Bible come to God's people and say, here's a message from God. Now because people couldn't go to God directly, many of the prophets did come talking from God, but there also were some false prophets as well. So as you read the Bible, very often you find people who are named prophets of God. Other times you also hear people who are named like false prophets or uh, people who are giving their own message and claiming it's from God. So if you remember all the way back to uh, my first episode, uh, we talked about how God created the world, how it was perfect, how he put Adam and Eve in the garden to take care of it. And they sinned. They went against God's will. They disobeyed his command and they were kicked out of the garden. But they were told by God himself, I'm going to send my son. I'm going to send a child to you who is going to make things right so that we can dwell together again. And throughout the Bible, we find many prophets who share God's story with the people of Israel, uh, who tell them uh, messages of hope, messages of comfort, sometimes messages of war and destruction because of their unbelief. But the prophet I wanted to talk about today wasn't actually an Israelite. So during the time of Moses, God uh, frees his people from slavery. They leave Egypt. They go uh, to Mount Sinai. They head up towards Canaan to the Promised Land. And somewhere along the way, they stop at this place called Moab. Now, the king of Moab is a man named Balak. And Balak and the entire country are afraid that the Israelites are going to come through. They're going to destroy everything, take all the food, take all the produce, and then leave the, the Moabites without anything. Because you have to remember, Israel about this time is about a million of people, possibly more. So Balak sends messages to this prophet named Balaam, uh, a man who's known to always predict the truth. So anything that he says happens will happen. So he says, you know, this field will be blessed, and it's blessed. He says, this other field is not going to produce anything this year, nothing happens. Everything that Balaam says happens just the way he says it. And so the messengers come to Balaam and they say, here is money from King Balak. Come with us to meet him, put a curse on these people uh, so that they will not prosper, so that they will have trouble, and so that they will leave the Moabites alone. And Balaam says, well, let me go and talk to God. And he does. He goes off and he's told, no, don't go. So Balaam comes back and says, sorry, I cannot accept your money. Goodbye. Messengers go back, talk to Balak, he gives them more money, they go back to Balaam. It happens a couple times, eventually Balaam is convinced, I'm going to go with them. So I like to use my imagination a little bit, it doesn't quite say this in the Bible, but uh, it's, the Bible says that the messengers are princes, and so I imagine these people are in like their finest clothes, they're riding their war horses, just amazing sight to see, uh, you know, showing off for everyone else. And then you've got Balaam riding along in these you know, commoners robes, riding on a donkey. Quite a ridiculous uh, comparison. And so they're riding on the road and God gets angry with Balaam. And so he sends an angel and the angel stands in the road and the donkey sees it and he runs off into the field. And so people possibly are laughing at him or just like, what are you doing, Balaam? Get out of here. And Balaam starts beating his donkey and says, come on, get back on the road. And they go on. They travel a little bit further, they get to a place where there's walls on both sides of the road, and once again the angel stands right in the middle of the road and the donkey leans up against the side and kind of like scrapes along, which of course is crushing Balaam's knee uh, and his leg against the wall. And so Balaam starts hitting the donkey again, what are you doing? I'm in front of these important men, I'm on this important mission, why are you making a fool of me? And they move on. Eventually this gets to this point where the, the road narrows and there's nowhere else to go and the angel stands there once again. And the donkey can't go anywhere else so it just sits down. And Balaam starts beating it once again. You silly animal, why are you causing me trouble? Let's just go. I'm looking foolish in front of these princes. They're going to give me money and I'm going to, you know, prof I can't do any of this stuff because you're not letting me go. And as he's beating the donkey, God allows it to speak. And so the donkey speaks to him and says, why are you hitting me? There's an angel standing there with the flaming sword about to kill you. I'm saving your life. Why are you beating me? And suddenly uh, Balaam is also allowed to see the angel. And he falls down flat on his face. And he says, I'm sorry. I realized I, I went against God. I knew I shouldn't have come, but I did anyway. They offered me this money stuff, right? And the angel says, go with them, but only say what I tell you to say. So Balaam gets on his donkey and they, they travel on, they meet Balak. 
and the king takes them to this mountain and looking out over the plain they see all the tents of Israel and he says there they are put a curse on them uh, make bad things happen to them so that they will leave me and my people alone and Balaam says, okay, sounds great. Build an altar. I need to go and pray a little bit. And so he goes off by himself. The angel teaches him a song. And he starts singing this song. Blessed are you, O Israel. Uh, blessed are those who bless you. Cursed are those who try and put a curse on you because God has chosen you as his own people. And Balak says, this is not at all what I wanted you to say. And Balaam says, I can only say what I'm supposed to say. And Balak says, all right, we'll try this again. Let's go to a different mountain. So they go to another mountain overlooking the Israelites and he says, here, maybe in this spot, your God will let you say whatever it is that you need to say. And so uh, here's some more money. Take whatever you need. Destroy these people with your words. And so Balaam goes off and talks to the angel, comes back, sings another song. And then it happens a third time. He goes to the third mountain. And so Balaam starts saying things like, a star is going to rise from the house of Judah, and there's going to be a scepter, a king coming out of Israel, and everyone is going to be blessed by these people, and they're going to be blessing to others. And then he specifically turns on the Moabites and starts saying all the bad things that will happen to the Moabites if they continue going against Israel. And then he gets on his donkey, and he rides home. Bala kind of is left standing there again with not specific, but they're just kind of like, uh, now what? Uh, just paid him lots of money for nothing. Uh, we read later on, Balaam does eventually give them a strategy for how they could destroy Israel, um, but God still defends them. Balaam ends up going back to war with King Balak. But Balaam's story doesn't just end uh, with his battle with the Israelites. Something like a thousand, thousand five hundred years later, you know, give or take a decade, uh, we find uh, several other kings or wise men or uh, magicians. Uh, there's different translations for the word. And all of a sudden, on a random night, we're not, we're not given a specific. They're out looking at the sky, and all of a sudden, there's a new star. Now, this is before light pollution. There's thousands, if not millions, of stars up there. How do they find one new one? But they do. They see one new star, and they look up and say, that one doesn't belong. Where did that come from? And so they go and they start to dig through all their scrolls and they dig through all their books. And as they're searching, they find this reference by Balaam. A star is going to rise out of Judah, a scepter out of Israel. And they say, ah, that star belongs to this king. We're going to go find him. And so they mount their camels and they grab gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh and other precious gifts. And they get ready to go and they make the journey uh, from Babylon, uh, about where Abraham started his journey, probably a little further east, and they travel to Israel. Now, traditionally, we think it took them about a year, two years, not entirely sure, um, but eventually they travel to Israel and they get there and the star disappears. Maybe it was a cloudy night, so, or they weren't looking. And so they go to Jerusalem and they look for the king in the palace and they start asking around, where's the one who was born, the king of the Jews? We saw his star in the east, we followed it to this place, and we're here to worship him. The news gets to the palace to King Herod, who is the current king of the Jews, and he's distressed, and the entire city is distressed with them. Uh, because, again, King Herod and Jesus, this is the time of the Roman Empire. They don't like sedition. They don't like uh, competition. And they appointed Herod king. And so if there's something wrong with this king, the entire city is going to suffer for it. And so everyone is distressed. And so Herod calls for the high priest, and he says, where is the king supposed to be born? Where is Messiah, the promised one of God, supposed to be born? And so they go to their scrolls, and they're reading, and they say, he's going to be born in Bethlehem, in the town of David. And so Herod calls them secretly and says, all right, Magi, uh, the king is going to be born in Bethlehem. Go find him. When you do, come back and tell me where he is so I can go and worship him. We find out later that's not Herod's original intent, but that's what he does. And so they leave Jerusalem, they see the star again, they rejoice and they follow it. And they find Joseph and they find Mary and they find baby Jesus. And when they see him, they kneel down and they worship him. They give him these gifts, proclaiming, you know, this is God's son. This is a, a special child. This is a king of Israel. And then an angel comes to them and says, warns them in a dream, don't go back. Don't tell Herod. Go another way. I want to start the, with this story because we hear the Christmas story a lot. We hear about Jesus, we hear about Joseph and the wise men and the angels and the shepherds, but sometimes we forget the really cool things that God put in place 
before it was time so that everyone would know what's going on. He said, you know, thousands of years, I'm sending my son. He speaks through Balaam. He's not an Israelite. He might not even have followed God. And he says, these are my people and I'm going to bless the world and my son is going to be born among them and he's going to be a king and to rule. And for me, it can be really easy to take the Christmas story, to listen, to hear about and say, this is really cool. All of this happened. All right, now what? But we read in the Bible, Jesus didn't just come to earth to be a king. He came to save the, save the world from our sin, to reunite us with God. Right? He, he, went, he lived a perfect life. He died on the cross to pay for our sins. He rose again. He goes back into heaven. But he says that I'm coming again. And so as we read the prophets, as we read the Christmas story, as we hear it again and again, we're reminded that not only has all of this happened, that God has already conquered over sin and death and made us alive and be able to worship with him again, but he says, one day I'm going to come back. I'm going to destroy death completely. I'm going to destroy sin, get rid of all the pain and the hurt and the tears. We're never going to be sad or sorrowful or, or hurt again. And I'm going to make a new heaven and a new earth. Watch for me. Wait for me. And so that's why we tell these stories again and again. It's not just to remember what God has done, which is amazing and awesome. But it's also a reminder that God is still working today. That God is still wanting to live with us, to be with us, to tent with us today. And that one day he'll come back and he's going to make everything right again. So I hope that you'll keep this in mind as, as we're celebrating that Christmas season, as we're celebrating Advent, that God has come and worked mighty works. And we remember that and we rejoice. But once again, he's going to come and he's going to make everything new. Pray with me, please. Lord, we praise you for the chance to, to remember your works, to remember uh, the prophets that you sent to give your words to us and to your people uh, over and over and over again. And we find comfort in the words where you say, be comforted, I will work. And we find warning in the times where you say, you know, I will destroy or I, I'm going to cut this off because you're, you're not following me. And we find this picture of you wanting to be with us, wanting us to live in such a way that we can be with you. And we praise you for, for the random, seemingly insignificant events. This guy named Balaam paid to go and, you know, say bad things about someone else and only being able to, to speak good of them. Uh, we find like amazing things like this donkey talking. Uh, we find a star showing up when it's not supposed to, in a place it's not supposed to, and people are watching for it and happen to see it when it happens. We find a baby born in a stable. Not at all what was expected of a king, not at all what was expected of Messiah, the promised one, the son of God. You work in these common, ordinary things to do miracles and miraculous signs. We ask that you come and work in our lives as well. Remind us of your love and dwell in us and help us to act uh, in your will as well. In your name I pray. Amen. So this last song is one of my favorite Advent songs, talking about how God is going to come and dwell with his people. Emmanuel, God with us. Oh, come, oh, come, Emmanuel, and ransom captive Israel that mourns in holy exile here until the Son of God appear. Rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel shall come to thee, O Israel. O come, thou day spring, come and cheer our spirits by thine advent here. Disperse the gloomy clouds of night, and death's dark shadows put to flight. Rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel shall come to thee, O Israel. O come, O come, Emmanuel, 
and ransom captive Israel that mourns in lowly exile here until the Son of God appear. Rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel shall come to thee, O Israel. Rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel shall come to thee, O Israel. Thy word is a lamp to my feet and a light unto my path. May you follow the words of the prophets and find Christ this season. God's peace. Hey, we did not turn off yet. We have so many messages to sing, so many songs to be sung.